you know, I want to shake people up a little bit. You know, part of the challenge is that, uh, you know, we don't expand our, our thought process because we're always in execution mode. Our conclusions have been, which are accepted uh, pretty broadly um, from the science community, is that about 7% of your health is determined by genetics, you know, and only less than 1% are really things that are really problematic, but that 93% of your health are designed, are impacted by your lifestyle and how your genes express themselves given the lifestyle, the multivariate lifestyle. So in essence, what I'm saying to you is, well, we're one of the top scientific institutions in um, studying basic science and biology. We know that the way biology you know, reacts is which is what we study is is reacting to your environment and how you do things. You know, and most of the dieting companies, you can look around the world today, they all came to the same conclusions, which is, okay, food is one element, okay, and it and it has to be, you know, you know, in some ways customized to you. But the second element is social connection. Um, are you doing it with other people? Do you do you hang out with people who are healthy? Facebook did a not a study, but they did a, an analysis and found that people who ended up gaining weight, their friends are heavier. So if you look at the top 10 people that you hang out with and how healthy they are, it will be a good indicator, um, you know, or, or it will be a good indicator of how healthy you'll be in the future, right? So one is what you eat. The other is who you hang out with. And the third is how you mix in movement, not just exercise, but movement, because exercise if you don't move 15 minutes every hour, then two hours of exercise every night is counterproductive. If you are connected with the world and you feel peace and you're connected to everything that you do every day, is there a negative by not having humans in it? Of course. But can you do you get other positives by being conscious and connected and have positivity and control? I'm talking to Blair Lacorte today an extraordinary person, a long-term executive leader. Um, he's also an inventor, innovator, uh, sits on the board of a few organizations, including the Buck Institute that does uh, a lot of research on health and relationships. And this is what we're going to be talking about. What's the effect of health and relationships on your longevity, health clearly, but what's the effect of relationships on your longevity? What's the effect of health and relationships on your business? Um, what can you do to improve these? We are going to be touching on the point of awareness. You're going to enjoy this episode. It's full of nuggets. It's full of statistics and important information that you wouldn't believe is actually being measured and uh, formally available for you to ponder upon. Enjoy. By the way, the number one thing in health, the number one correlate, which people don't want to believe, and I can explain it, you know, is that, look, relationship is the number one correlate to health. So diet and exercise and sleep and maintenance, uh, you have a 10 times force multiplier on them if you have a relationship in your life. So a dietic relationship is the most powerful thing. And I, it, it's it's physiologically, humans are the only animal that has a parasympathetic nervous system with a vagus nerve that attaches their brain to their heart, to their stomach, to all of their organs. And so the way that the vagus nerve works is the way you feel and how safe you feel and do you feel love actually impacts every organ in your body and how your immune system rebalances your system biology. So it's not just that you have people that care about you. If you believe that someone's compassionate to you, which you may believe, they have to believe it, that they love you, it has a massive impact. So for instance, drugs have a 60% bigger impact if you believe your doctor cares about you. People recover from surgery 25 to 50% better if they believe someone's praying for them and that, that they really care about them. Um, people live an average of 10 years longer if you have at least one dyadic relationship at any given time in your life through your lifespan and your level of chronic illnesses and inflammation-based illnesses go down. So we can make up a bunch of stuff about that we're wizards of the world and that science is everything. Mm -hmm. But the best science in the world is something we don't understand, which is we were designed with a parasympathetic nervous system 
And we're, we're also the only animal in the world that can imagine connection. We're the only animal in the world that can actually say, I met you, I like you, that we are connected now. And when those two things come into play, the human body, the mind and the body actually reorient themselves. So when you look at the number one drivers, it's connection and purpose. And they're inter intermingled. So for me, there is no difference between health and relationship. If you don't have relationship, which includes relationship with yourself, because the whole point of belief is that you actually love yourself and are willing to take the risk to love someone else because, you know, our first line of defense is fear. And so everything that we do is around positioning and fear and how quickly we let someone get in through the nine levels of intimacy. Um, but, you know, there's been tons of, I mean, it's, it's, the studies are just immense. It's just that it's very difficult for people because they want to believe that um, it's more complicated than that. And it's not. And, you know, what happens in uh, nutrition, like our no diet works. I've owned two diet companies. I've made a lot of money. Exercise is not what humans are designed for. Right. Um, I've owned, you know, 1800 gyms at a certain point in my life when I added them all up. Um, so diets and exercise are not the answer. Um, well, it's really you know, when you get down to the science, we're the number one scientific institute in the world. We invented ketosis. We what, invented. What do, you, what do you mean by we? What is the organization? The, the, the Buck Institute. So we're on the vice chair. So we invent we found, you know, we we found uh, senos, you know, you know, senescence. We've, you know, basic research found a lot of different things. But when you put it all together, it's really just about how the human body works. So certain diets are good for certain people and they're bad for others. Everyone is a personal system biology. But it all starts with if you feel connected, then your system is ready to take in nutrition. It's ready to take in movement um, and it's it's ready to do maintenance mm -hmm. and uh, so you get them what we call in the military a force multiplier it allows you to actually multiply what you're doing nutritionally by 10 because you also your immune system is happy yeah and happiness to us is you know whether you like the word love or not it's around connection mm -hmm. now there's some people on a normal curve who don't there, there are some people, you know, that don't need need too much or don't need anything. But for most of us, um, what drives our lives is how we decide to connect. Um, I, you know, I went on a speaking tour about 10 years ago with a buddy of mine who was a, um, a you know, a hospice doctor, a palliative care doctor. And so he actually sat with people when they died. He sat with a thousand people. And you hear the cliches and the stories about what people talk about when they die. Um, so out of the top 10 things that they talk about, there's four that always come up across geography, across culture, across age. Um, and the four are things that you would expect, um, but you have to think about why they're there. Who do I love? Who loves me? Did my life mean anything? Did I make a difference in my life? And the fourth one, I think, is the most haunting because it's the one that's 100% in our control. Um, and it's the one that that um, people have the hardest time with is was I my authentic self? Did I do what I wanted to do? Did I take the risks I wanted to take? Did I love the people I wanted to love? Did I do that? Because that one, you can't blame on anyone but yourself. And that's the part um, that's most difficult. It's the gift we have as humans, is that we have a survival capability, right? And our survival capability is based on fear. Um, there's two sociological concepts that are very, you know, heavy on, you know, us. one is fear and the other is social comparison. How are we doing? How are we doing? Which is really, how can we survive, right? I want to compare myself. Now you've seen how that can be used against us in social media and other places, but they're built into who we are. We're always going to worry, is something going to kill us? And we're always going to worry, are we doing well? Um, but if you really think about it and you turn them around, um, well, those are also the things that bring us um, the most joy, right? Which is how do I not be fearful and trustful? And how in social comparison, do I not compare myself how I'm doing, but how I'm doing in my relationships? And the, you know, in the United States, when you take a look at a bunch of the studies, look, the average man in the United States, and this has got a little bit to do with cultural, has less than one friend on average. 
That's what they self-report. That's how they feel. Mm -hmm. That's why men die sooner than women in the United States, right? Whereas women tend to have three to five and they define it very differently. Men define what a friend is, is how long I've known them. Mm -hmm. Not how many times I talk to them and not what I talk about. Women define friends as people I talk to a lot and I talk to about certain things, which tend to be more intimate things because they're worried and they can take away fear by doing it. So women, their best friends aren't always their oldest friends. Yeah. yeah. Men, there's a high correlation. Now that's cultural, right? It's not because men are, you know, obviously men are different than women physiologically, but mentally we're, you know, we're pushed into different buckets for how we cope with stress. But in any country, actually, the longevity of men is lower than the longevity of women on average 10 years. Average. Right. And, and that's got as much to do not with friends, but with their um, their support of family and their support of relationship in general and their ability to communicate, um, to communicate connection. Mm -hmm. right? That it doesn't mean that obviously men are worse at everything and women are better at everything. I mean, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that. Um, men tend to be less judgmental and women tend to be more judgmental when something happens to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they did a study with, uh, with youngsters and two boys would fight one day and they'd be friends the next. And the two girls would fight one day and they wouldn't be friends for a month. Mm -hmm. So it's not, there's not a, an absolute good or bad. It's just that over time, women tend to um, both culturally and sociologically tend to find that relationships benefit them and they tend to just practice and get better at what they do. You know, we're all energy. So anyone that believes we're not is is just trying to fool themselves. But look, in some ways, you know, humans have dealt with their fear and lack of control by building in thought processes and technologies that they think make it better. The problem, and I, I we can we can go over to business, but the problem with healthcare systems, especially healthcare systems in the United States, is they're all designed to fix. Mm -hmm. And once you've broken, it's the lowest potential return and the highest cost, because now you're broken and now you need to fix it. So we're very good at fixing things, and we have huge industries around that. I, I always laugh at the example of a constant glucose monitor. Like, have you ever used a, con a constant glucose monitor? No. Okay. I'm perfectly so healthy. <laughs> it's very difficult for you to know what's good for you. Now, look, I can tell you that a variety of food and non-processed food and that I can tell you that uh, calorie restriction is good for you. And that's common for humans. But if you ask me what kind of food you should be eating and when you should be eating it, the only way to figure that out is to do a CGM, which is a constant glucose monitor, which figures out what foods when you eat it spike your glucose, mm -hmm. right? Because that is what is the, you know, your glucose spikes, and if it spikes too much, it causes inflammation and co constant inflammation. The other is your biome, which will tell you what you're allergic to and what you're interacting with. So if you haven't done those two tests, it's pretty difficult to uh, to tell you what diet you should be on. Um, and the same goes with exercise. Everyone, different types of exercise are, are different. But energy fields, they have the same, you know, same. some people are very, very... Uh, susceptible to energy fields and some people aren't at all and you just need to understand that because if you are um and you can get positive energy around you on a daily basis it changes the way your immune system feels safe and therefore your body rebalances itself so it's not about interjecting a fix the number one fix to us is to first start out with trying to be as healthy as we can then if there's something wrong then we fix it but we try to wait till our body breaks and then we try to fix it. Every time you take a drug or have an operation, it changes your system biology forever. Mm -hmm. And my, you'll my never be sufficient. Nutrition, if I may briefly share, my idea yeah. of nutrition is actually that each each food represents um, a certain organ or a certain energy that is needed at the time. And the body, if you're, um, let's say, aware of it, conscious of it, naturally knows what you should be feeding it and when. So... Uh, most people have a diluted um, perception of when they're hungry and when they should eat what because of, um, I would say, of uh, stress uh, factors. And um, basically, they're not in connection with, with themselves. Right. We're, we're, we format ourselves to not make eating part of 
how we feel about the world, but it's a it's this task exactly. that we have to get done. But you know, I will tell you though that my point with the CGM is we've had CGMs for 30 years because hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent for diabetics to be able to put it on your arm to figure out what foods are spiking your insulin. But you, if you put it on now as a healthy person, can actually figure out what foods are good for you or not. So mm-hmm. if you don't have the perception and you can't feel it, sometimes eating strawberries in the morning is very good for you. Sometimes it's it's it for certain people, you need to eat fruit in the afternoon. Every person is different. And in order to actually listen to your body, you have to listen to your body. Now, if you can't feel it, we have things right now that we that we we develop for sick people, diabetics that you can use, and it will actually tell you how your body is processing food. Mm-hmm. And so, my goal is to try to get people to think about being proactive about collecting data, so that they can personalize what they do. There is no one right thing or wrong thing to do. There's things that are right or wrong for you. But possibly the the foods are also situationally good for you or not good for you. This means in the morning or in certain situation, a certain type of food may be good for you, and then at another moment it it can that, and, and that was, that that's my point, right? It's also temporal. Yeah. it's It's chronological. The same way your sleep is. your chron, your, chron, your chronosome affects everything you do. So, for instance, if you're actually not paying attention to when you should go to bed that it doesn't matter when you get up what matters was when you go to bed because if you go to bed at the right time and you do it consistently five or seven days a week you will actually get deep sleep because deep sleep happens on your chronotype in the first two hours of your chronotype so if you go to bed later than you should you won't get as much deep sleep if you go to bed earlier than you should the REM sleep comes in the last two hours you'll get less REM sleep than you should And so if you really want to help your body, you would know when your body wants deep sleep and wants REM sleep. If you go to bed at the right time, you automatically wake up at the right time without an alarm. So we really shouldn't have alarms to, to get up. We should only have alarms to remind us it's time for bed, right? Mm-hmm. And and so let your body. So to your point about food, your body also has a cycle temporally about when it wants certain foods. So intermittent fasting is is good because it causes a low level of autophagy, which is it stresses out your cells enough that it brings the energy to the inside of your cells. And therefore, a lot of the misreplications and the viruses don't get energy, right? It also is good for you because your body isn't processing food during that time, so it can actually heal itself. But whether you should skip breakfast or dinner is really dependent on the on the person. For some people, Intermittent fasting in the morning where you don't eat breakfast is very bad for you, mm-hmm. especially for women. Um, it's it tends to be skewed that way. But for some people, skip and uh, skipping dinner is very bad for you. But you won't know until you pay attention to your body. So, you know, my big thing is that, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to help other people, um, you have to help yourself and then you have to help other people. And that's the way it is in business as well right, is that you can't be playing a sport, which is what all businesses is, is a sport. It isn't life. Life is love and life is your health. We play a sport and we get paid for it. And for a lot of us, um, we're so much better off than most people in the world who don't get to choose what they do. So if we're going to play a sport, if you were playing a sport, you would, wouldn't play hard every single minute of the game. You would be able to drink or take a sip of water or rest. So recovery will also determine both your effectiveness and your longevity if you're as an athlete. So if you if you stress yourself out too hard for too long and you don't recover, then you're going to break your system. And that, you know, and the, the key is you want to be around for a while and you want to be effective. If you want to play your sport, then don't hurt yourself, mm-hmm. right? Find ways to, just the same way you would nutrition and sleep, find ways to, because we like stress. Stress is not bad. The human body is designed to stress. The only way you grow is through cognitive dissonance, and cognitive dissonance is stress. It means mental stress that you're struggling with something which makes you grow. The human body wants stress to build muscle. It wants stress to build um, your cardiovascular system. So stress itself is not bad. The killer of most people is chronic stress. It's that stress continues at a low level and doesn't go away. So all the studies that I've seen says, yes, high intensity training is really good for you, but you only need about 10 minutes a day, but you also need 10 minutes of low intensity. 
which could be sitting in the dark. It could be meditating. It could be watching TV um, if you can zone out. But your body doesn't want to get stuck in the middle level. Um, and part of the problem in, in westernized societies is I used to design targeting systems for military jets, and we had to biomimic the human eye. So when you biomimic the human eye, what you find is vector velocity and size is what you look for, is something big going fast heading towards me, right? And humans were designed that way so they wouldn't get eaten by animals. Well, when you walk down the street in the city, um, there's cars going by all the time, and you say, no, but I've trained my brain that those cars are not dangerous, so they're big and they're fast and they're coming towards me, but they're okay. The fact is you have them because your subconscious will still be processing those as danger. It will be overridden by your conscious, but it will be processing that as danger and it'll be stressing you out and keeping your stress level up to 15, 20%. So when people say, yes, I've seen a study that walking in nature is actually uh, very beneficial to longevity, I say, well, let's tie it back to why. It isn't that you're in nature per se, it's that you're not in places where large objects are moving and making loud noises, which your stress can go down. And most of the chords in nature are self-resolving like classical music. So when you look at the studies on music, if you have a rock band, it agitates and brings up adrenaline, which is why 18 to 25 year old males love it. But if you look at classical music, the chords resolve and therefore your parasympathetic system believes that it's safe and it calms down. So nature has a lot of resolving chords. And if it doesn't, and there's a big growl, you should be stressed out because there's something bad going to happen to you. So part of the problem is we've created environments that by nature, excuse the pun, actually cause us to be stressed out subconsciously all the time. So most westernized societies, your, your stress stays above 25% and never goes above 85%. Now you can say, well, I understand the 25%, I need to go down. But why are you worried that it doesn't go above 85%? Because if you don't at least have high intensity once a day, your hormones and your immune system don't balance themselves because every machine wants to rev up and rev down at least once a day so it can see how it's feeling. So if you don't have enough stress or you or, or you have too much ambient stress, both of them are just as um, dangerous. The connection between health, relationship and business, they're all, they're the same thing. It's just that when we talk about business, we talk about how you do change in an environment where we're playing as a sport. And therefore everyone's bought into it, we get paid for it and we can make some of our own decisions. When you're talking about health, when it's got to do with your family, you have a connection with them that is different and you can't always be right. Sometimes you have to let your spouse be right, even if it's not exactly right. And when you talk about yourself, you have to be compassionate because if you don't give yourself a rest and you're not kind to yourself, the brain does not know uh, the difference between when you say something negative or think something negative and whether something negative has happened. Uh -huh. There's, there's no, you know, it's proven they, which is why positive thinking and visualization in sports works because if you can convince yourself everything's okay, you're okay. The difference in your personal life and with yourself is you have to actually believe it. It doesn't just help you get through the day. You want to have it be self-reinforcing so that you can be stronger every day, so you can build up a reserve, right? So they're all the same things. It's just are you applying it to yourself or you're applying it to your your family and friends or are you applying it to your teammates? Just yeah. so you don't think I'm, I'm Pollyannish, there's also been studies done on culture and businesses. And it turns out that positive culture in general works better, works better, but that negative culture can be extremely effective. Yeah. And the diff and the difference is as long as it's consistent. When you and, and and now I'm not saying it's it's constructive for a human that people don't have higher turnover or don't have more problems, but a business can be effective in a neg with a negative culture. It can make money. So yeah. if the if the if the determinant is people say, well, you'll never make money if you're negative, or why do negative companies make money? You can make money with a positive mindset or you can make money with a negative as long as it's really consistent and it's, you know, and you do and you execute well. So what I say to people is, look, decide, you know, what kind of culture you want to have in your business um, and then try to make it consistent. It doesn't have to be perfect. 
but consistency makes people feel safe. Now, inside that consistency, you have to have diversity of thought so people can argue and it can change over time. But again, at any given time, you wanna make sure that everyone's bought in, but if someone wants to make an argument and say this is wrong, then go with it and see where it will take you. But you have to bring everyone with you. The time that businesses break down is when you balkanize it, when certain segments still think one way and another segment thinks another way. And I believe that's the job of leaders is to say we're in this together. So you may not be happy with everything. We're not going to make everything. The world isn't fair. The world isn't just. Um, but you have to make it to the point where it's, it, it's livable. Right. Like you may not like that, um, you know, that there's certain types of meetings. You don't like big meetings, but for some people they do. And that's a compromise. But we still have to look at some people who say, well, we need more one on one meetings to balance them. Right. What do you mean by a negative culture? How do you define a negative culture? What would that, that they, you know, that they don't necessarily care about the people. You know, I can think of one high tech company I competed against where they had a very negative culture. It was you they, you would get fired if you missed your goal. There was no talking. There was no development. There was no anything. But I paid you a lot of money. And they were very, very effective. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because everyone knew the rules. Mm -hmm. And the people who went in there, if they weren't the right people, they got spit out very quickly because no one cared. There are other cultures where, you know, I have seen where we really try to develop people and find them the right job. And those can be very effective. Right. It's it's not a value judgment per se. I don't want to work in a company that doesn't necessarily care about people, but cares about the efficiency of the machine. But look, you could work in that company. You could make a lot of money and you could go do great things with your life. But you decided to, you know, that that was OK. It's you know, it's a personal decision. We started this conversation uh, talking about relationships in the um, nonprofit that you're on the board of. What was it called again? Where you do the research? Oh, the, Bu the Buck Institute. The Buck Institute. Um, do you do research on the effect of relationships? Do you measure this somehow? Sure. So we, you know, our main focus is is you know, working on basic research, biological research, but. Because we're looking at how the body responds to things, we also end up working with different people and looking at different studies about things that uh, that impact basic biology and basic health span. So what I can tell you is that our conclusions have been, which are accepted uh, pretty broadly um, from the science community, is that about 7% of your health is determined by genetics you know, and only less than 1% are really things that are really problematic, but that 93% of your health are designed, are impacted by your lifestyle and how your genes express themselves given the lifestyle, the multivariate lifestyle. So in essence, what I'm saying to you is, well, we're one of the top scientific institutions in um, studying basic science and biology. We know that the way biology, you know, reacts is which is what we study is is reacting to your environment and how you do things. So, like one of the greatest uh, impacts on Alzheimer's is can be exercise. It's you know just it's it's a lifestyle thing that stops the you know the processes that are going on and slows them down. So we look a lot at um, lifestyle interventions. What I would say to you is, after three years, I've come to grips with the fact that. It's much easier for me to tell you what drug works and how it works because you understand it and you do it because it's easy. You could say, I could take metformin or I could do this and I understand why it works for me, right? It's much more difficult, even though I can tell you, I can tell you 10 things that would probably add 10 years of healthy health span to your life. While those 10 things you would say, I understand all of them. They take less than a half an hour a day. The chances of you doing them are probably 20% because- um, I read a great book called Atomic Habits uh, last month. And in the book, he talks about the reason you do things, behavioral science, not just math. I can tell you, you know, math, this is why it works. Behavioral science, when you believe that that thing um, represents something you believe about yourself, like I'm an athlete or I feel young, you will do it versus you saying, I'm doing this because I want to be an athlete or I want to be young. You have to actually believe that I'm doing this because this is who I am. So number one, you associate your psychology with it. 
Number two is habits that aren't enjoyable to you or can't be built in to places that are easy for you will eventually fall off. So then you have to say, okay, I know that nutrition is important. So let me take a look at what, how I could do nutrition in a way that would be enjoyable to me and that would, would not be hard because again, why don't diets work? I, I, I love diets. You know, we, You know, diets are the only product in the world, and this is statistically proven. The only diets in the are the only product in the world that you will fail 80% of the time on a diet. You will fail, okay? And you will blame it on yourself and not the product. (laughs) And you'll be back in 18 months. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a wonderful product. I just keep giving it to you. You fail at it, you blame yourself, and then you come back because you thought I can do it this time. In reality, number one, diets is a multivariate. It's not just, um, I had one company that was portion control. It was very good for people. It stopped them from eating a lot. But if they didn't like the taste of the food or the food that we were providing them wasn't the right food for them, then it's not going to be as effective if you look at all three things, right? Um, so when when you look at this, you know, and most of the dieting companies, you can look around the world today, they all came to the same conclusions which is, okay, food is one element, okay? And it, and it has to be, you know, you know, in some ways customized to you. But the second element is social connection. Um, are you doing it with other people? Do you, do you hang out with people who are healthy? Facebook did a, not a study, but they did a, an analysis and found that people who ended up gaining weight, their friends are heavier. Mm-hmm. So you can ask yourself, is it because they're gaining weight and everyone they hang out with is gaining weight because they're doing the same things. Or when I'm gaining weight, do I end up hanging out with people who gain weight because I don't want to hang out with people who are skinny because it makes me feel bad? It doesn't matter. When you hang out with people who want to do the same things you do, you do them not just because it's good for you, but because you fit in with the tribe. So if you look at the top 10 people that you hang out with and how healthy they are, it will be a good indicator um, you know, or, or it would be a good indicator of how healthy you'll be in the future, right? So one is what you eat. The other is who you hang out with. And the third is how you mix in movement, not just exercise, but movement. Because exercise, if you don't move 15 minutes every hour, then two hours of exercise every night is counterproductive. Right. It's a bad trade yeah. because the way that your body works in both processing food and rebalancing itself, if you sit which is why they call sitting the new uh, cigarette. Hoping, if yeah. you sit, all the toxins go into your joints and your organs and they don't move. And so when you move 15 minutes every hour, your body is moving things around and therefore exercise is more effective. But sitting for five or six hours and then exercising for two is, is a very bad trade yeah. uh, for you. So when we talk again, when we talk about this, think about what I said before. It's not just what you do, i.e. what you eat. It's not. It's who you hang out with and how you do it. And so most of life is, is that way. And when you're changing a business, I always look at, you know, how, do, how am I looking at this holistically? It's not just the right answer. It's not just what we have to do. It's not what the food is. It's how am I actually interacting with the people, right? And what steps are we taking as a coach to give them more and more confidence that they're in control because they'll be calmer, they'll be happier. And and for most people, they may not be unbelievably aggressive, but they like the fact that they know they're making a difference. And the people who are aggressive will take, grab it and even push push harder than that. So- Uh, Blair, may I ask you uh, regarding the environment? Now now that most people have their meetings online and don't come out of their homes still, uh, not so much as before. Does uh, your environment uh, is it defined only by the physical proximity of the people, or could it be the interaction that you have? Well, it, listen, you you and I are probably going to agree that I think that there's always a trade off, and that a physical environment, it, you know, within three feet of someone, you feel their energy, whether you feel it consciously or not, you are impacted by their energy. Yeah. Lots of studies done on positivity where you don't even have to actually be interacting with someone in your office who's not positive and it brings down your immune system, mm-hmm. right? So there is definitely a positive to connecting with people. Now let's look at the trade-off, 
right? I'm working at home, so I have more time to spend with my family. So I am getting some connection, right? So there may be, and I'm doing more athletics because I don't have to commute. There's trade-offs. But what I would say is, now, what are you losing? You're losing that connection um, and that team orientation with people you work with. So you have to figure out how to make that up. So I'm not saying that remote work is bad. What I'm saying is it gives you things and it takes things away. But if you're not conscious of what it's taking away, then ultimately it will hurt you, right? And so, I, you know, you just have to figure out how you mitigate that. For some companies, in my last company, I tried to get people to come in three days a week. I think it worked. It was very difficult, but I think I got a balance for it. Um, but for some companies, they can't get people to come in three days a week. So what they do is once a month, they have a day where everyone comes in and they do a bunch of social things. And then one day a month, they come in and they do a bunch of work meetings where you had to be in a meeting. That's just a different way of trying to mitigate the fact that you need some physical connection with the people you work with. Mm -hmm. yeah, my point was not necessarily about remote work, but like our whole lives, like families are separated from family members. They communicate, you know, by a... Whatever. But it's 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 the same concept. It's clearly if you were living in a small village and you had three generations of your family and you knew that they loved you and you got to see them, even if you got fights with them, because that's what families do, you would find some level of tribal safety in that yeah. that you lose when you move around. Now, what do you gain when you move around? You can do different things. If you were stuck in your village, you may not be able to do what you want to do. Right. So there's never of absolute, oh, I shouldn't say never, but most of the time there's not an absolute. There's a, a, a to your point, a self-awareness of what's happening to you, whether that's with what foods are good for you, what relationships are good for you. That's what I think that, that we've lost um, in a lot of places is our self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Starting with ourselves, how do I feel? And therefore, how could I adjust this, which is then control, which is then when I get success and I feel good, then you get encouragement. So that whole idea of self-awareness, you know, to adjustment, to encouragement, that cycle gets broken down into tasks. And then the only way you can judge yourself in social comparison is how much money am I making? What my title is, you know, it, it's not healthy because that really isn't what sustains us. It may be good that I make more money or that I have a certain title, but it's not what all, you know, that's not what sustains people. Mm -hmm. One step back to your point of relationships being the biggest impact or having the biggest impact on your health. Uh, when we take Buddhist monks, for example, or anybody living in seclusion and they're still healthy and they live a very long life, would you say it's because they don't get, get the negative impact of relationships, although they don't have the positive ones? Right. So again, I'm going to give you my you know opinion on this. And I, I spent a lot of time with... Uh, um, one of my good friends ran a Dalai Lama foundation is that uh, it's a, just a different way of looking at it. it. If you are connected with the world and you feel peace mm -hmm. and you're connected to everything that you do every day, is there a negative by not having humans in it? Of course. But can you, do you get other positives by being conscious and connected and have positivity and control? Of course. Would I like to do that? I, I don't think I would, but there's certain people where that is enough, right? That, that is enough and they can make great impacts on the world by bringing us back their learning and interacting with us on a, on a, you know, a more limited basis. Or that may be that they just found their place in, in nature um, and in the cosmos. Um, so again, there will be extremes of everything um, and I think what you do is you got to figure out what you're giving up and, and what you have. Um, I, I think that they would tell you they have a lot. They have love. What I would tell you is that there are other people in the world who uh, need to be surrounded by people all the time because that's the way their system biology and their psychology works. And they they don't feel whole on, like an extrovert unless they're in with people. Now, they may not go as deep as the monk went in their connection. Yeah. But the physical proximity to them may be enough. And then we all have to figure out where that balance is with us. And again, that still comes. I'll leave you for, for today with where we started, which is if you're not self-aware, there's no way to optimize 
-hmm. If you don't know where you are and who you are, then how do you know what you should do? And so I think it, it, you know, it starts with us. Although we're afraid of being alone, um, it's also sometimes one of the most healthy things is for us to love ourselves without the input from other people. I love that. You have such a such a rich expertise on so many areas. It's like um, you can talk about almost anything out there and, and also backed by experience and research. Uh, I know you didn't come to this podcast with the idea to promote any services, but for the people that do want to engage with you, tell us a bit more about the upcoming event that you have on the PPE. What was it? What does what does PPE stand for? Actually, it it was I did not name it, but it's Pinnacle Performers Elite. So it was uh, it was designed as kind of a fun thing to say, you know, if you are you know an owner of a a business, you are the elite. You know, the you know at least in America, when you look at the statistics. Only one of uh, in a million businesses gets to be ten million dollars in revenue for over five years. So a lot of the people that that I've dealt with you know, a lot of big companies, but my parents were entrepreneurs and had small companies. So a lot of the people I coach are people who have businesses between five and ten million and two hundred million in revenue, and that's a very different mindset because I'm an owner and I've probably been doing it for more than ten years, and I've probably been very difficult and lonely in some cases because I'm. You know, I had to figure everything out myself. And so what we do is three times a year, we bring a bunch of these people together. I think I have 40 different industries and they they relate to each other about what it's like to be an owner operator um, and what it's like to try to figure out how to deal with intergenerational, what, what's happening with my kids and should I have them in the business? What, what it's how to deal with, how do I grow the business? How do I deal with competition? Um, or how do I deal with selling the business someday? How would I position it so that someday I'm gonna I'm gonna sell a business? So in, in essence, I although we talk about our businesses and our sports, really what we do is we talk about, you know, how we are as humans. You know, we talk about our health. We talk about business tools that you may use, and then we talk to each other about what I may have done in one industry that it never occurred to me I could do that in my industry, um, and so. Hopefully we get rejuvenated after a couple of days and then we go out and we we have fun doing what we do. But three times a year, we get away from everybody and we and we hang out. So if people want to see what the agenda is, you can go to the PPE Mastermind website. And this year we're in uh, Northern Cal or this session, we're in Northern California. But there also is a way to watch it on video. So if people wanted to watch it on video, you know, um, send us a note. And uh, we have a video connection, but it's a really eclectic, fun group of people. Um, who are some of the speakers who are joining you in this session? So I try to, you know, to to really um, get people that would make you think differently because they're people that you would never uh, probably talk to on the same day. So we have um, people like Martin Luther King the uh, Third, whose father was obviously the iconic. Um, politician and changed the way we looked at civil rights. And he's been an, uh, an activist and a um, an advocate for social justice. He's going to talk a little bit about his father and uh, he's going to talk a lot about what he's doing today. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, my friend Scott won the Pulitzer Prize for photography and he's going to take you through photojournalism of all the over the years, what he's done and how he believes it impacts the world and how he believes that his passion for photographing and for having people feel a certain way when they see something matters. Um, I have another one of my friends who's won 29 Emmys, who's going to talk about how to how to run a meeting so that you keep people engaged in a meeting, especially a remote meeting. Um, I have uh, Jay Abram, who was Tony Robbins' mentor. So help Tony Robbins be who he is today and has a famous capability of doing, you know, hot seats with you for five minutes, talk about your business and give you a bunch of ideas. So very, very diverse um, set of people. My friend uh, Ryan, who was the head designer for Puma and Uggs and Albers and a few other shoe brands, um, is going to talk about creativity because he helped start a degree in University of Michigan where you had mechanical engineering and design and how creativity and engineering fit together and you know how he's built his career around that. 
um, and inspiring people and building better products, but products that people have an emotional connection to. Um, so, you know, a, a very, 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 my, my buddy, Willie, who won the Olympic gold medal in the, uh, um, it won Olympic gold medal in the Summer Olympics, but also can be a Winter Olympics, Super Bowl champion, um, holds more world records than anyone um, in history. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about how his mindset, what he does every day, um, how he started new businesses after athletics. But he's got a very different perspective on uh, on how positive mindset, what he does every single day that's allowed him to uh, be so prolific across so many decades of athletics. So, and, you know, just getting them to be candid. A lot of time people come and give speeches and that's their job. Um, but what we like to do is get people to interact with the audience and ask and answer different questions that, that, that get them to think, but also get us to hear things we wouldn't hear. 